with Wings Productions presents Chapter 25 of The Skylark Bell Skydive. I'm your host, Melissa Oliveri. In last week's episode, Farfalla began to embrace her new role and status within the ancient forest group. She was also introduced to the ancient oak, a tree reminiscent of the oak at Meadow Lane. In today's episode, we read chapter 25, A Chaotic Swirl of a Dream, in which Farfalla has a dream with kaleidoscopic images of her past, present, and future. Today's podcast partner is Generally Spooky, also a member of the Bupod Network. If you are interested in learning about the often spooky and haunting history of Scotland, you won't want to miss this one. Hosts Ely and Kieran sprinkle just the right amount of humor into each episode. Just check the show notes for a link to the Generally Spooky podcast. And now you know what to do. It's time to settle in, grab a blanket and a warm drink, and let's get started. The instructions came so clearly like a conversation with a trusted teacher, a friend, a confidant. The ancient oak wanted something, something quite simple and small, the size of an acorn, and I have been given something invaluable in return. Instructions on how to make the Skylark Bell. I will need the entire tribe to help me. I've noticed a change in them, ever since they realized I can communicate with the ancient oak. They have always revered oak trees and cohabitated with nature, even gotten animals to do their bidding. But they have never had the capacity for this two-way communication like I have. I have no explanation for it, this ability, but I know one thing. It has put me into a position of power. The man with the long dark beard stands on the beach, his arms bent at the elbow, resting on his hips. He is squinting at the image Farfalla has drawn in the sand with a stick. Farfalla has been living with the tribe for nearly three years now, but her grasp of their complex language is still very loose, so she has taken to drawing out her instructions. Corbin, she says, turning to the man, can you do this? She stumbles through the words in his language. The man turns to her and nods, smiling with pride. He is an expert at shaping and engraving metals. He is essential to her plan. The matter settled. They amble back up the beach. On a whim, Farfalla picks a violet and hands it to him. Thank you, she says. Topalat. He smiles at her and holds his hand out. She grasps it shyly and lets him guide her up the steep embankment back toward the forest. Farfalla never thought she would open her heart up again, but loneliness has gotten the better of her. She and Corbin, despite their limited communication, have become quite friendly over the years. It has taken her some time to gather full instructions from the ancient oak, but at last it is time to make the bell. Corbin will forge and engrave it. Then there will be a ceremony with fire, tinctures, herbs, song, and dance. Then the bell will be complete. Farfalla's deepest wish is to use it to return to her beloved Elizabeth. Farfalla lays a kiss on Corbin's cheek as they part ways. He heads to his tent to begin his work, and Farfalla lets herself into Kalia's tent. Kalia has been unwell for several weeks, and Farfalla has been caring for her. How are you feeling today? She asks cheerfully as she prepares some herbal tea with the hot water from the kettle she grabbed out of the community fire. I'm tired, but there is still life in me, says Kalia, her parched lips parting into a smile. Farfalla helps the old woman sit up in her cot, then hands her the steaming concoction. Thistle, bog myrtle, heather, and something else I can't quite decipher, says Kalia, as she inhales the steam swirling out of her cup. 
oak bark, says Farfalla, smiling. Don't worry, I asked for permission before taking some, she adds with a wink. Corbin is going to start making the bell today, she says, changing the topic. Kalia nods, a faraway look in her eye. What is it, Kalia? You seem concerned, she notes. Kalia shakes her head, her silver crown of curls brushing back and forth over her shoulders. Nothing to trouble you with at this time, she says. You seem to know so much more about me, about everything, than you let on. Is there a reason you won't tell me? Farfalla presses on. I believe your future is fluid. I don't think you are constrained to living it as you have before. That is why I tell you nothing of it, so you can make your own choices, forge your own path. I am hopeful that this time... Kalia lets the thought trail off. Farfalla doesn't respond, but lets Kalia's last words resonate around the tent. This time. Farfalla helps Kalia lay back down and stands guard until the old woman is asleep. She then grabs the kettle before she slips out of the tent. Farfalla fills the kettle with water, then hangs it back on the rod that stretches across the fire. It is dusk, and there is a cool edge to the breeze to indicate the end of summer. It seems like only yesterday they were celebrating the arrival of spring. Farfalla walks to the edge of the clearing and sees the red deer standing by, waiting for her. They've gotten into the habit of walking through the woods and watching the moon rise by the rock near what would eventually become Carnifex property. Hello, Rue, she whispers, running her hand over the soft red fur for which she gave the animal its name. Are you ready for our walk? The deer steps forward, and they head off into the forest. They walk the familiar paths side by side with Farfalla chattering about her conversations with the ancient oak and her preparations for making the Skylark Bell. Finally, they come to the edge of the forest and stand next to the ancient stone that will one day serve as a marker between the fields of Carnifex House and the neighboring farm. Farfalla leans on the rock and watches the moon rise. It is almost full only the slimmest shred of it remaining unlit. They stand for the better part of an hour, silent, basking in the silvery moonlight, before turning and walking back through the forest to the encampment. The deer stops short of the clearing, and Farfalla says her goodbyes before continuing on by herself. She lets herself into her tent and collapses onto her straw bed, exhausted, Farfalla has only been asleep for an hour or so when the dream begins. At first, it is a familiar dream where she is underwater, sinking into the sand with the sun's rays filtering through the water above her head before everything goes dark. This time, though, she sees Marius' face as he reaches down to pull her from the water. She collapses into his arms, and he pulls her up the beach into the tall, dry grass beyond. Suddenly, they are at Meadow Lane. Farfalla turns to Marius and watches in horror as he slowly transforms into a magpie, stretching his black and white wings before lifting off into the sky. She watches until he disappears, then turns when she feels a presence by her side. There is James, a look of pain and disappointment on his face. He leans toward her and lets out a loud accusatory caw before vanishing into thin air. Farfalla recoils in fear and squeezes her eyes closed. When she reopens them, she is inside the house at Meadow Lane, staring into the mirror of the vanity in her bedroom. She sees a girl there who looks very much like her, but is dressed oddly and going on about the silence. The girl fades away, and Farfalla sees the forest reflected in the mirror. She turns on her stool and sees the winding path through the woods ahead of her, and Rue standing proudly, 
head held high with his crown of antlers reaching for the canopy of leaves above. She walks to the deer, and they begin to amble down the path. As they are walking, Farfalla gets the feeling the deer has gotten larger. She turns to look and gasps when she sees Cormorant by her side, his dark coat blending with the shadows of the forest, while his white mane and tail look like they are glowing from the inside. The massive horse stops short of the clearing, and Farfalla looks on in horror. The ancient oak is engulfed in flames from top to bottom. The loud crackling noise reminds her of the sound as the trees from her beloved apple orchard were burned in the fireplace during the terrible winter of 1925. Farfalla can feel the acrid smoke filling her lungs and wakes up coughing and heaving for air. She sits up in bed and it takes her a moment to remember where she is. She shakes off the sensation of being disoriented and fills her cup with water from the jug by her bed. She runs through the various chaotically swirling elements of the dream in her mind. Water, fire, deer, horse, magpie, Marius, James, the ancient oak. She feels like there is a warning in it all, but can't quite decipher it. Exhausted, Farfalla lays back down. Tomorrow is an important day. Tomorrow the bell will be finished. Farfalla closes her eyes and falls into a long, dreamless sleep. Thank you so much for listening. Join me next week for Chapter 26, The Making of a Bell in which Farfalla uses the instructions from the ancient oak to create the Skylark Bell. The Skylark Bell podcast is brought to you by Fate and Starling Publishing and features original music by Canal. If you are enjoying this story, please consider leaving a rating or review. They're both greatly appreciated. You can also support my work by subscribing to Patreon or Coffee where you get early access to episodes, as well as MP3 downloads of the music, artwork, behind-the-scenes videos, and so much more. You can also find the Skylark Bell exclusive merch on my website, theskylarkbell.com. Just check the show notes for all necessary links. Once again, thank you for listening. I'm Melissa Oliveri, and this is the Skylark Bell Podcast.